Hey, some of you are excited about that because you intentionally sit next to somebody that you're like, what's up, girl? What's up? <laughs> hey, are you ready to hear God's word today? Because I'm ready to preach it. Um, this is one of those messages that has gone through about three different iterations this week. And I was feeling a little bit kind of nervous about it. And, and Saturday night, you know, we kind of got into it. And I just really feel like this is a, a foundational message for our church of course, we're in this collection of talks called Expedition, where we're saying there's this journey that God is taking us all on. That knowing God, giving your life to, to follow him, receiving what Jesus has done for you, is the starting line. And you need to do that. And some of you today, that's your step. And I'm going to give you that opportunity by the time you leave here today. Because we want to introduce you to this Jesus above all else. But then he wants to take us on this journey. Of, of, of finding family, getting together in community. Like that's where we find freedom. That's where we find hope. And then learning why he created us. The two best days in your life are, what are they? The day you were born and the day you discovered why you were born. And so he wants to take us on this journey to say, hey, this is why you're here. This is why I created you. And so we're in this collection of talks to do just that. And today I wanna talk about finding family. If you have your Bible, Psalm 133, is where we're going to be. Uh, you can use your phone. Uh, we're going to have it up here on the screen behind us. Or if you have a good old-fashioned paper Bible, that's awesome. Psalm 133. I'm going to read this from the message version. It says in verse 1, How wonderful, how beautiful, when brothers and sisters get along. And all the parents in the room said, Amen. Is that not the truth? When your kids are getting along. Like things are going well. It says, it's like costly anointing oil flowing down head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, flowing down the collar of his priestly robe. So imagine this picture. It's just, it's going everywhere. It's like the dew on Mount Hermon. It's like Mountain Dew. Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's God's drink. Mountain Dew. Diet Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew flowing down the slopes of Zion. Yes, that's where God commands the blessing. It says that's where God ordains eternal life. I want to introduce this, this message and the title of this message with a quick story. Because when I first read that line, how wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along, I immediately thought about my brothers and how we didn't get along. Like all we did was fight. I'm the middle of three boys very competitive boys who just, we compete, we can make a, a competition out of anything, right? And no matter how much you love your siblings, those of you that know, no matter how much you love your siblings, there are times you're going to fight, right? You're going to get all up in each other's face. You might even throw hands. It might get to that level. I don't know. I only threw a fist at, at my brothers like one time. In fact, we were driving in a car and he said something snarky and I tried to punch him while I was driving. Don't do that. But we would get into fights. And it says how wonderful and beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. And we would get into fights about stupid stuff. You remember growing up, fighting with your siblings? We would often get into fights about games. Like how many games, uh, how many people played Uno? You guys play Uno? We fight about Uno. Like we, we would cheat in Uno. Like if, I'll, I'll still beat you in Uno, by the way. Like if we're playing Uno together and you get a, get up to go to the bathroom, I know what your cards are before you come back, just so you know, because I'm going to win. I'm going to win. But we would fight in Monopoly. And I remember one time we had this fight break out in Monopoly because sometimes my mom would play with us. And you know, the goal of Monopoly is to, you know, take everybody's money and to, to win it all. Well, my mom, you know, thought it would be a good idea to allow my younger brothers to play longer. So she would slide $500 bills underneath the table. And I'm like, that's not how you play Monopoly. It's called Monopoly. It's not called welfare. Like, you're not allowed to. <laughs> the game is long enough as it is. Why are you trying to keep this thing going? But she wanted to balance the scales. But inevitably, we would fight about something. And my parents, when we fought, would often say the same thing. And this is something that, you know, Kristen and I have adopted a little bit in our parenting. But the first thing my mother would say is this. She'd say, hey, boys, straighten up and fly right. Anybody else's parents say that? A few of you, I don't even know where that saying came from, but that's the first thing my mom would say, straighten up, fly right. And then she would look at us in the middle of our argument in the fight, and she would say this, boys, we are family. 
Those are your brothers, and they're the only ones you've got. We are family. If you want a title for this talk today, that's it right there. We are family. Here's a subtitle. You can write it down. So straighten up and fly right. We are family. I feel the the spirit of Sister Sledge coming on. We are family. Anybody? It's going to get crazier than that. Just stay with me. In this journey that God is taking us on, you need to understand this. You were not meant to go at it alone. None of us. There is no such thing as an El Solo Lobo, Lone Wolf. No such thing in the kingdom of God. You are not meant to do this life alone. And I'm talking about this because October kicks off another round, another launch of our groups in this church. There is no shortage of ways for you to get connected. We're starting brotherhood groups the first week of October, sisterhood groups the first week of October, Financial Peace University. We're starting Fresh Start for those of you that are just kind of getting uh, are new to the faith. Like serve teams are, are groups. There is no shortage of ways for you to get connected. And so I thought I'd bring a, a message about the importance and the benefits and the blessing that comes with being connected in the community, in the family, known as the local church. You know the word church? It comes from, well, the, the Greek word in the, the New Testament, because the New Testament is translated from the original Greek, was the word ekklesia, which meant gathering. It was gathering. Later on, it turned into this, this, this word in the Old English uh, is where we get the word church, and that means house. In fact, it means the, the Lord's house. It's this gathering in, the, in a house. It's a family. And it's important for us to remind ourselves from time to time that when you came into the faith, you didn't step into a private faith. It's not just about you. When you stepped into faith, you stepped into a family. And if you are even considering becoming a follower of Jesus today, and I hope that some of you are, I feel it necessary to tell you exactly what that means. And exactly what it is you are signing up for. Because when you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to a family. When you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to to doing life with a group of people. Because people are a part of your faith. People are a part of the journey. People are a part of the ways that you and I grow. And that might not resonate with some of you because you might be thinking, well, Colby, people didn't die for me. Jesus did. And so I love Jesus, but I don't even like people. I love Jesus. But why do I have to to like people? Why do I have to be in a family? Let me explain it like this. Um, It's kind of like when you get married. I remember when Kristen and I were getting serious about uh, our relationship, and I was excited to introduce her to my family, but I felt it necessary that if this relationship was going to last, I needed to prepare her for all that my family was. Some of you know what I'm talking about kind of needed to give her a heads up as to what she was signing up for, right? And so I'd already met her family, which they're, they're normal. They're somewhat normal. Her dad is pretty normal. Her mom is uh, what the, you know, the teenagers would call extra. She's just extra. She's a whole different level, all right, if you know her. She's crazy. <laughs> but I needed to make sure I prepared her for, um, not my mom. My mom's amazing. My dad's amazing too, by the way. I didn't mean that to sound weird. But for my dad, for my pops, because my pops is just extra as well. He's just a whole different, different level, and I love him. He's one of the funniest guys that I know. But if you don't understand him, then, well, for example, Kristen and I, we went out to dinner with my dad, one of the first dinners that I think we had together with him as a couple uh, somewhere in Florida. And we sat down at the table, and my dad is sitting there, and he looks up at the sky, And as the server comes by, he says, excuse me, do you have a a menu in Braille? And I know some of you are like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know your dad was blind. He's not. (laughs) He's not blind. That's just my dad. And so he starts doing this on the menu, starts starts feeling it. He's like, do you guys have a, so that's just my dad. And if you don't, you know, know that, you might take offense to that, but he's just crazy. He's the guy that will have a conversation through the, the, the microphone thing at Chick-fil-A in the drive-thru for about five minutes before we even pull ahead. Lately, here's his latest thing, and I'll, and I'll stop telling you about my dad because I don't want you to think badly about him. Uh, he's, this is the latest thing he'll do is he'll call us up on our birthdays, and he will sing happy birthday to my kids 
as a cat. <laughs> Meowing. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Am I telling the truth? He's crazy. And so I felt it necessary when that stuff happened to be able to look at my wife and say, see, that's what I'm talking about, right? And so I think she was appreciative of the heads up that I, I gave her because obviously we got married 25 years ago. Awesome. Uh, crazy thing about our families, it did not surprise us. And here's what I'm trying to say with all this. The metaphor that God uses for the relationship with us, his church and Christ, do you know what it is? It's that of a marriage. Like it says, we are the bride. He is the, the groom. And so when you marry Christ, you marry into the family. And you don't always get to choose family, do you? If you marry Jesus, you get Jesus' kids. You get the brothers and you get the sisters. And if you're not sure who that is, just look around. Look to your left, look to your right. That's what they look like. I'm just telling you. What you don't get to say is, well, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, but I'm going to live my faith out in isolation. You don't get to say that. No, you get the whole family. You, you get me. You get this guy <laughs> right here. You get all of us. Like, we're all coming together. And in fact, I wrote it out this way in my notes. There's no such thing as an only child in God's family. There's no such thing. Like it or not, no follower of Jesus is an only child. So you don't get to stay home and live your faith alone. That's not a thing. You have to take on the entire family. Because when God moves, you need to know this, he does it through families. He does it through groups. He does it through communities. Think about it when, when Jesus, you know, chose, uh, you know, guys to cont continue the mission of taking the gospel to the world, he picked 12. When, when you know, Moses had a, a, an Aaron and also a Hur, Jonathan had his armor bearer, like climbing up that hill with him together. Uh, when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, there were 120 people in the, the upper room. Like God moves through community, he moves through, through family. So for anybody to say, well, all I need is God and that's it, you're missing it. All I need is, is God for it to be the church. I'm just telling you, if it worked that way, then God and Adam in the garden would have been enough. But it wasn't enough, was it? What did God say? It is not good for man to be alone. He has to do life with someone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. They're doing life together. In fact, if you want to summarize the complete Bible in five words, I can do it. Jesus did it for us himself. For those of you that don't want to read your Bible because you don't have time, I think you should make time, but I can summarize it in five words because when he was asked by the Pharisees, can you boil this whole thing down for us? What's the most important thing in the, the law and the prophets? Like, w what is this all about? Here's what Jesus said. Love God and love people. Love God and love people because like it or not, people are a part of the puzzle. It's family. We were never meant to do life alone any more than it's possible to play basketball alone. Can, can you, alone, can you throw me that rock? Give me that rock. Thank you. What's up, girl? That's, that's my girl. Now, back in the day, I'd play a little basketball. I would take a ball and I would practice. I would go down to the playground, local playground. I'd sit, sit there and dribble like this, you know, a bunch. I'd just keep dribbling, keep dribbling. I, I practice shooting a little bit. I'm going to practice shooting. You catch this ball for me? All right, check this out. Man, look at that rotation. Oh, that was almost too far. <laughs> like, I'd practice shooting a little bit and, and I'd kind of be down there at the, the playground. But how many of you know I wasn't playing basketball? I was practicing. You cannot play basketball by yourself. You need others around you. And so inevitably, people would start showing up to the court, and they'd start picking teams. And so I'd be over there like this, you know, doing this. I might, I might try to, you know, do one of these things, kind of. You know, it's not very good, I know. I'm just telling you. Like, but I, I'd practice like this, and I, I'd even wear the right shorts. I'd have the headband. I might do one of these deals like, like, oh, what's up? You thought I was throwing that. What's up? You know? And so when they start picking teams, they'd be like, oh, I like that guy. I'll take that guy. I'd be like, me? Oh, yeah. Of course. You know. 
of course you want me on your team. And so I'm playing a little bit, picking teams, and then the game would start. And they would learn real fast that all of this was no good. <laughs> because this white boy could not play basketball. This white boy could not jump. Like, basketball does not run deep in the Atkins family genes. And so I was fine by myself. I was good playing by myself all day long. Looked okay, like I had it figured out. But when people got onto the court, I couldn't do it. Do you know the measure of following a, uh, uh, Jesus, the measure of following God as a Christian is not how well you play by yourself. It's how well you play when others get on the court, right? How well do you play then? When people, like, are you, are you, are you a, 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 an assist player? Do you pass the ball? Are you kind? Are you generous with it? Do you foul a lot of people? You know, do you, do you hog the ball all the time? How kind are you? How do you live your life with other people, not just when you play by yourself? Because here's what a lot of Christians do. Like, I'm, I can pray all day by myself. I'm good. I can worship, oh, believe me, I can worship in my car by myself, I got this, I can worship, or I can fast. But if all this stuff that happens in private does not make you better in public, then what's the point? What's the point? If all this stuff that you practice in private, if the, the vertical relationship that you work on in private, which you should, by the way, does not impact the horizontal relationships in your life, what are we doing? Are you with me? Like, why come to church? Seriously, not a trick question. Why come to church if this does not make a difference in your life tomorrow? If this does not make a difference in your life today, in your family, why show up here at all? Colby, should we practice? Yes, practice. We should practice. But your practicing should make you love God better so that you can better love people. Does that make sense? I'm going to give this back to you. But look at this rotation, y'all. That's fire. That's fire right there. That's fire. But let's be real, right? People don't always make it easy to play on the court with one another. Does it? Because people foul you? Because people throw elbows? <laughs> because people, you know, or how about the guy that, that you play with all the time that's always getting fouled? He's like, and one, and one, and one. It's like, shut up. Let's just play. <laughs> we are family, but I did not say we are one big happy family. And I hate to be the one to break it to you if you are kicking the tires of faith, so to speak. Um, but I feel like I should, should warn you, not all Christians are nice. Hello. Is that not the truth? People can be a problem. People can be a pain. People can be petty about things and cause drama and fights. But any time any of those things about people tries to convince you that you are better off living your life in isolation, can I remind you of two things? The first is you can be that way too. I can be that way too. And I would hate for someone to discard us for the worst parts of us. Aren't you grateful that God didn't do that? Yes. I'm so grateful. Woo! So we can be that way too. But the second thing is this. No matter how painful, no matter how petty people can be, relationships are always worth it. It's worth it. This is how God designed us and wired us. We read in that Psalms that said, how wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along. So there is a promise that can only be found in family. No matter how difficult, no matter how tough times get, like we need to get along. We must come together because we are family. Let me give you three things about a family. Number one, you ready for it? Because we are family, we are each other's home. We're each other's home. Psalm 133, look at it again. It's called a song of ascent of David. Sometimes in your Bible, it won't just list the verse. It won't just list the text. It will list a description of what it is you're about to read. And this is one of those times it says it's a song of ascent of, of David. How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get, get along. All psalms, just so we know, are songs 
or prayers. And 15 of those are called songs of ascent. What is a song of an ascent? Well, back during this time period, like there was only one church. And so if you wanted to go worship God in in the church, in the temple, the one true God, you would go from all over to the church in Jerusalem. And so three times a year, which by the way, can I just say, please come to church more than three times a year, all right? This is not enough. I'm just telling you right now. Like three times a year, people would travel from all over to go to Jerusalem. So these would be the songs that they would sing on their way, on this journey, on this expedition as they climbed and ascended to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was up on a hill. And so they would sing sing these songs. This is one of 15 of them. And by the way, we do the same thing when we go on a trip, do we not? Like you remember going to spring break and you made your spring break mixtape back in 1998? Remember that? I don't know what you put on there. But on your, on your way to Daytona Beach or Myrtle Beach during your freshman year of college or, or during vacation, you put a playlist together so that you could sing songs in the car perhaps with one another. And you did that, why? To make the time go by. To make the, the trip a little bit easier. And so this is what they were doing on this long trip to Jerusalem from all over. Now, when I say we are each other's home, that might not make sense because you're like, PC, how are we a a home. How are people a home? Well, we often view home as a physical address or a physical location. But when you're on a journey, when you're on this exped- expedition, this, 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 this pilgrimage, how can you find a home when you're constantly on the move? Here's why this matters, because this journey, this pilgrimage that they took three times a year to Jerusalem is actually a metaphor for our life. How many of you know this is not our home? It's not our home. The Bible says this is a blip. This life on this earth is a, a blip, but our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. What did Jesus tell his disciples? I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. So do you know why sometimes you feel you're out of place? Because this is not the place. We are aliens and strangers in this world. That's what Paul, Paul tells us. And so this is not our, our home. So while we are not there yet, heaven yet, this journey, this journey can get lonely, can it not? Do you know that after the the pandemic, they did a survey and they found that 49% of people had extreme loneliness that's still going on, by the way. We're not done with a pandemic. It's a pandemic of loneliness that's happening. This journey can be lonely. This journey can be, be scary sometimes. It can be long. So how do you find a home when you're constantly on the move? Here's the answer. It's people. It's people. It's family. It's community. It's being together. Like picture this, tens of thousands of people on this journey, traveling together. Same road, same path, same purpose, same goal. Like all together, climbing, like singing songs along the way, singing the same songs, one of these 15 songs, and all these people were different from different parts. They came from north, south, east, west. There were black people, white people, brown people, Egyptians, Ethiopians. I mean, people came from from all over, and they're worshiping the same God. What did we sing earlier? The same God singing the same songs. How many of you know songs can be powerful? Songs can be uniting. Can they not? Like when you know the same song as someone else? Like, I'll prove it to you. You're going to have to play along with me in this, all right? Just so you know, I'm going to start a song, you finish it. Now, uh, this worked really well on Saturday and in the, the 830 service this morning. Just so you know, they said that you guys cannot do as good as them. I don't know. They were talking a little bit of trash. I think you can. But uh, I'm going to start it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover a different, you know, a bunch of, of different genres of music because this is a multicultural, multi-generational kind of church. And so I don't wanna leave anybody hanging out there. So you don't leave me hanging up here, okay? If I start it, you finish it. All right, you ready? All right, let's see how this goes. Yeah, this is gonna be rough. Here we go, here we go. I have confidence in you. Oh, we're halfway there. Take my hand. We'll make it, I swear. Oh, Come on, let's go. See, you guys nailed it. You know what I'm talking about. 
And while we're doing this, because that was a warm-up, while we're doing this, I want you to look around. And I want you to notice the people who are singing with you. You ready for this one? All right, here we go. Sweet Caroline. Good times never been so good. So good, so good. So good. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I, love it, I love it. All right, how about this for the, the younger, maybe younger generation, which is my generation. <laughs> Just kidding. I say younger, but um, you are my f- the one believe when I say oh yeah tell me why no I'm just kidding we won't you guys will worship you'll worship to some Backstreet Boys why do you sing louder to that all right, let me, let me give one more for my, um, you know, got to give a nod to the hip-hop crowd, all right, just so you know, in the room. And I have to be careful with these because some lyrics can be a little bit suspect. <laughs> so don't dig too deep on this. But um, I wish I was a little bit, I wish I was a, I wish I had a girl who looked good. I, could, I wish I had a rabbit and a hat and a bat with a 6'4". All right, I lost you on that. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Now, what's amazing is if you look around and you see people singing with you, you might not even know their name, but you're like, hey, you know that song? I know that song. We're singing the same song? We're singing the same music? Can you not tell a lot about somebody by the music that they sing, by what they listen to? Like if you rolled up to church today and you were just bumping some country music, that says a lot about you. First of all, I'm going to invite you to come down front, and we're going to pray for you at the altar. (laughs) Know who you are. That's how I'm looking right here, bro. Just saying. You need to stop dipping. You need to stop, you know, whatever it is. I'm just kidding. But it says a lot about you. If you you rolled up listening to some hip-hop, it says a lot about you. I could tell a little bit about maybe your, your generation. I could tell a little bit about where you came from. If you rolled up here, you know, throwing opera on level 10, I don't know anything about you, just so you know. (laughs) But you're probably killing it in life. You're doing amazing right now. There's something about music that that unites us. So as they're walking, like, let's try try this one with me. One more. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that Doesn't, doesn't, that, doesn't that say something about you? Doesn't that say something about your heritage, your history, maybe the hope that you have in Christ, maybe what you've gone through? Doesn't that say something about the time you realized that you were lost and broken? Man, the music is powerful. It unites us. Blessed assurance. I think the reason they were singing is because they were all going through the same wrestling match of life that we are. And they're headed in the same direction, the same road. And what are they saying? How wonderful, how beautiful it is when brothers and sisters get along. In fact, they're, they're probably going down this road together and they're like, you know what? This is a long, has it been long for you? Yeah, it's been long for me too. Do your feet hurt? Yeah, my feet are killing me. You know, did, did you yell at your kids yesterday when they kind of got out? Yeah, I yelled at my kids. I'm trying to do better, but could it be that what unites us in heaven together is that we all had to go through similar things here on this earth? Could it be that that's what, what, what brings us together, what creates community is not about where you live, but it's about who lives inside of you? Isn't that what unites us together? Is that what makes us a, a family? Like singing on this journey. I mean, it just connected them. It united them. It also brought protection. It also brought, brought safety. How is that, Colby? Because on this, this pilgrimage three times a year, thieves knew that this was going to be a thing. And so they would hide out on the roads 
you know, waiting for this, this caravan of people so maybe they could fall, see somebody that's kind of falling short a little bit or somebody that's a little bit isolated and try to take him out, which is, by the way, what the enemy does for us as well when we isolate ourselves. And so they would hide alongside the road, and so maybe it's dark and it's nighttime and you're in this journey and all of a sudden you hear something rustling behind you. You know what I'm going to do in that moment? I'm going to start saying, how wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters, hey, brothers, sisters, get along, right? And maybe, maybe somebody's not right with you, but, but 50 yards down the way, somebody hears you and they're like, oh yeah, how wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters get along and somebody else that's closer starts singing when brothers and sisters get along and what was one person to start with has now become an army of people. How many of you know there's safety in numbers? And so there's safety in a family, there's safety in a group together, and not just safety on the outside, but there's also safety on the inside. Because sometimes my worst enemy, you know who it is? Is me. And sometimes I need another voice. Hey brother, hey brother, hey sister, I need another voice speaking into my life. When I've had conversations with the devil all week long, and he's told me who I am, I need someone else to grab a shield and a sword and jump into my heart and say, you are not that thought, you are not broken, you are not your bad relationship, you are not an addict. Are you with me? Like this is where we like draw our home from one another. We are family. Please, please, as your pastor, please don't do life alone. Like, it's that important. It is life or death. When you, when you live alone, when you are, are subject to your own thoughts, they will kill you faster than any, any thief will kill you. Don't do life alone. Your family, you are, you are home. People come alongside of you to protect you, to walk this journey with you. Something else we need to realize, number two, we are family. We are also each other's priests. Here's what it says in verse 2. You guys with me? Are we good? 133.2, it says, Like costly anointing oil flowing down the head and beard, flowing down Aaron's beard, flowing down the collar of his priestly robes. If you don't know it, Aaron or Aaron is the high priest during this time. Like now Jesus is our high priest, by the way. Jesus was our ultimate sacrifice, you know, for our sins. So Jesus is our high priest. But what this means is that there used to be one person that would minister to all the people. However, this is telling us when Christians, when brothers and sisters get along, when family is functioning the way that it should in this moment, it's not one person ministering to everybody. It's, it's we all together become each other's ministers, become each other's pastors. Theologically, this is referred to as the priesthood of believers. And it's also found in the New Testament in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people. Look at your neighbor right now and say, you're chosen. Tell them, say, I choose you. No, don't say that. Just say, you're chosen. You're chosen. <laughs> a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a holy nation, a holy family, holy community, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a family, not a people, but now you are the, the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Listen, follower of Jesus, you, you're, now you're a family. Now you are a community. And, and as a community, you become, you become ministers, you become priests to one another. And priests back in this time period, they did four things, by the way. First, they, they would be there to encourage you, they would be there to correct you, they would pray for you, and they would offer sacrifices on your behalf. That's what priests did. And so you need those four people in your life, each one of you. Like you need somebody to encourage you, somebody to come alongside you when that day comes. You know what day I'm talking about? That day, the day you get a phone call, the day you get a doctor report that's not what you were expecting, the day all hell breaks loose in your life, you need someone there to encourage you. You also need someone there to correct you when you just go crazy. Like you need somebody to correct you, someone who can speak truth into your, your life. 
Listen, I'm telling you, if you don't have someone in your life who's willing to tell you when your breath stinks, either you have really good oral hygiene or you just don't have friends, right? Like you have to have somebody correct you. You need to have people pray for you. Pray for you. You need to have those people who are willing to sacrifice for you. And any people in your family at any given time can be this in your life. Did you know my wife has been my priest? There are times she's been my priest. Because there are times where she's been able to speak truth into my life. Like, she doesn't have a degree in theology. She doesn't have, you know, degrees in in Bible, whatever kind of thing. Like, no, she has an accounting degree and a LAP CPA license. But she's one of the wisest people I know on the planet. And when I've needed it, she'll speak truth. She's, She's that representative in my life. Did you know your kids can be priests in your life? You ever have those days where you've gone through tragedy and you feel broken and worn out like everything's falling apart and your little son or daughter comes up to you, puts her little tiny hands on your face and says, everything's going to be all right, mommy. Everything's going to be all right, daddy. Are you telling me they can't be your priest in that moment and encourage you and comfort you? Like we, there's like one time in the Bible, like if you don't think God can speak through anybody, there was a time in the Bible God spoke to a man named Balaam through a donkey. A donkey. If God can speak through an ass. And just so you know, your pastor did not cuss. Don't go saying my pastor cusses and it's okay. That is the official name of that animal. Read your New King James Version or your King James Version. I'm just telling you, it's in there. If God can speak through that, listen to me, who can't he use to speak to you? And I'm I'm very serious about this. Because there is something that you need in your life that you are, un, are unwilling to receive simply because of the package that is being delivered in. Because they don't look like you. Because they didn't grow up like you. Because they don't sound like you. At any moment in a family, you could have someone step up and be a priest in your life that speaks a timely word over your situation that allows you to get through this week that allows you to get through this day. Are you with me? We are each other's priests. We're each other's priests. And here's my last one, and that is this. We are each other's hope. Hope. And I'll have the band come help me finish this. Now, I know some of you would say, well, Colby, I don't put my hope in people. And I understand that. People fail you. People let you down. We are, and just so you know, we're we're a bunch of imperfect people here too. Doing our best to worship a perfect and holy God and we don't always get it right and we fail. And so some people would say, well, I just, I'm not going to put my hope in people. I'm just going to put my hope in in God. And I get that. But look at verse 3 in Psalm 133. It says this, it's like the dew. Someone say the dew. It's like the dew on Mount Hermon. It's like Mountain Dew flowing down the slopes of Zion. Yes, that's where God commands the blessing and ordains eternal life. Mount Hermon is 9,200 feet above sea level. It's above the, you know, there's a tree line there too. So above it, you know, nothing grows except grass. Grass grows. And what's funny is a mere 200 miles away is the Dead Sea, which is 1,400 feet below sea level. But how does something that's above the clouds get watered? The answer, Mountain Dew. It's pretty much the answer for everything. (laughs) And what happens is at night it gets so cold, right, the condensation starts to form. And you've experienced this too if you've ever gone camping and been outside without a tent. And maybe you, were, you slept outside in a sleeping bag, you wake up the next morning, and what happened? The sleeping bag is drenched, is it not? It's wet, it's soaked. It's, it's because of the, the dew that came. So even though the sun comes up in the morning, you know who the sun is, by the way? In the book of Revelation, if you read it, I think it's in chapter 21 or 22, it says in the new heaven, you know, there will be no sun, that God himself is a sun. Like, even though we need the sun, 
You know what we also need for things to grow? The, the water. The dew. And so the dew is there to help the grass grow, to help the grass get through the night until the sun comes up. I don't want you to miss this. What do you need in your night times of trouble? What do you need in your dark seasons in your life? You need hope. You need hope. Like, I need you. We need you. We need each other like the grass needs the dew. Like, family is, is your hope. You need people to have hope. And I know some, some people would say, well, fortunately, PC, I, I have family. They're all online on social media, but I'm connected to thousands. In fact, Colby, I just posted a video the other day, and it got tens and tens of hits. It was amazing. It was phenomenal. Can I tell you, like, whenever you see somebody winning online, there's, there's a, a chance that you'll, in turn, think that you're losing. Is that not true? And it will cause you to stay stuck. But when you have family and you sit down face to face across from them, like I know this is, some people say, well, Colby, in a group, it's the same thing. If I see somebody else who's, who's killing it in life, it still makes me feel bad. No, it doesn't. In fact, it is significantly different. When you sit down across from someone in life and they share their story with you and they are winning and they connect it back to the reason that they're winning is because of God, that doesn't cause you to to shrink back, you know what that does? It causes something to rise up. Because what you're saying is, well, if he can do it for them, if he can do it in her life. And so when I sit across the table from someone who tells me what God's been able to bring them out of and bring them through, it does not cause me to, to, to compare myself to where they are. It causes me to say, well, if God is able to bring him out of cancer, he's able to do it for me. If God is able to bring her out of her brokenness and anxiety and depression, why can't he do it for me? I draw hope from that. I draw strength from that. In fact, even just showing up in a group, showing up on a serve team, you can look at one another and say, man, I did not know you struggled with that too. So do I. So that encourages me. It builds me up. It's very different sitting behind a screen than sitting across from someone face to face. Hearing about the ways God has blessed them or praying for them, being a priest to them, being their home, singing the same songs together connected to one another, united there during the scary times on the scary roads. Now, there is an action step today, and that is I'm going to ask you to get into a group. I'm going to ask you to get on a team, no apologies, get in a group, do life with people, and here's your pushback already. I, I can sense it. There are three reasons why you wouldn't. One is some of you would say, um, Colby, I've tried it before, and it just didn't work. I tried it before, and the people were just too weird. <laughs> okay, maybe. But saying that you tried it once and will never try it again is like saying, you know, I tried ice cream one time, and it was pistachio nut, and so I don't like all ice cream. I don't think that's fair, personally. Just because you decided to try pistachio nut ice cream does not mean that you're not going to like. My point is there are a lot of different flavors out there. And just because you pick the one with nuts, some groups have nuts. We do the best that we can to filter those nuts out <laughs> and make sure they're not leading. <laughs> but just to say you tried it once doesn't mean that in this season of your life, this is not exactly what you need. Are you with me? Or some people would say this, they'll say, Colby, I'm too busy. Too busy. Are you too busy to eat? Are you too busy to sleep? Are you too busy to to breathe and some of you think that's very extreme it is but I need you to see relationships on that level the importance and significance of doing life together on that level it is that critical to your life that you were not created to go at this alone in fact it could mean the difference between life or death 
And some of you know that. Some of you know firsthand what it means to lean on people in the times you need it. And then the last excuse some of you might say is this, well, I've been hurt before. Colby, the church has hurt me. And that's real. I get that. Maybe someone's hurt you. Someone's um, caused you to lose trust in them in their life. But can I just say this? If the, if the enemy could use people to hurt you, don't you think God could use people to heal you? So would you try again? In fact, this is what James 5, 16 tells us, that we are to, to um, confess our sins to one another and pray for each other so that we may be healed. See, we go to God and confess to God so that we can be forgiven, but we go to God's people for healing to find freedom. I'm just telling you, this is the journey that God has us on. And family is a part of it. So straighten up. Fly right. You receive God's word today? Come on. Let's, uh, let's do this. I'm going to pray for you. And then Kelsey's going to come out and give you some next steps and tell you what to do next. Are you with me? I'm a little holler for Kelsey. Okay. I don't know how Will's going to feel about that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for family. God, thank you that this is the way you've designed us to, to grow, that this is the community that we need. God, thank you this is the way that we are to get through life together, knowing that this life is temporary on this earth, that this is not our home, so the people around us, God, are our home. And so I pray, God, that you would, would draw us closer together, closer to you, closer to each other. Help us to, to practice in private loving you better so that we can love those around us better in public. And so, God, I pray right now you would convict us through your spirit that this is the next step that we need to take. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.